We finished off our previous video by looking at the types of genetic material present in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, genetic material presents itself as one single DNA molecule. And contrastingly, in eukaryotic cells, which is going to be the bulk of this lecture, looking at eukaryotic cells genetic material, that genetic material actually presents itself in the form of chromosomes. And we're going to be looking at chromosomes in this next flowchart. So we'll entitle the flowchart chromosomes. And before we get into the actual details of chromosomes, let's just break down the word. Chromo means color and so means body. This comes from the idea of when you look at a cell, um, specifically usually a cell that's dividing, you actually notice that um, it is going to show up these colored bodies that are very prominent looking. And so for that reason, scientists have called them chromosomes. They're colored bodies. They have this X-like shape. We'll get into that a little bit later. So first of all, chromosomes, in terms of their structure, we have to uh, mention that their structure is highly organized. So they have a highly organized structure. And specifically what we mean by this is the idea that they have a DNA double helix, of course, because they consist of DNA and our DNA is in a double helix. But this double helix, DNA double helix, is actually wrapped around, now let me rewrite that, it's wrapped around by proteins. Um, and it's wrapped around these proteins, specifically these proteins are known as histones. So eukaryotes, only eukaryotes, have histone proteins. Histone proteins um, are basically circular sort of proteins that associate with DNA, and we imagine a histone as a protein combining with DNA. And when the protein and DNA combine, that's going to give us a histone. So it usually looks like a circle, and then on this circle protein um, is a DNA molecule sort of like this. And they wrap itself around that histone. And as it wraps itself around the histone, we've established now a highly organized structure. It's not just DNA floating around. It's actually wrapped around a protein called the histone. So in addition, when you have several histones, you can actually further organize that structure into what are known as nucleosomes. Nucleosomes are defined as eight histone eight histones, so eight molecules of protein and eight protein molecules and eight DNA molecules, let's say, that overall uh, consist of about 146 nucleotide pairs. Let me write six. 146 nucleotide pairs of DNA. We don't really need to understand the specifics of that, just understand that a bunch of histones make up a nucleosome. Eight histones make up a nucleosome. One histone would be protein and DNA wrapped around that specific circular protein like we drew here. And in addition, nucleosomes will consist of linker DNA. Nucleosomes will connect to other nucleosomes, so this eight histone structure will connect to another eight histone structure. By using linker DNA, that's about 60 nucleotide pairs. So overall, we understand that chromosomes have a very highly organized structure. Not only is it DNA, but DNA is wrapped around proteins. Those proteins and DNA combine to make histones. And histones wrap around themselves or combine with themselves, eight of them, to create a nucleosome. And nucleosomes can connect to each other via linker DNA. So it's a very organized structure. And it's very important to have an organized structure because you want to make sure that this highly valuable DNA molecule is protected and highly sort of organized in a very nice and accessible fashion, which we'll look at later. Moving forward, we have to understand the term gene as well. A gene is something that is the defined as simply the basic unit of info. It's a basic unit of information, um, and specifically that unit of information can be used to make things like a protein. You take this information, I imagine you take a blueprint and you build something. You build something off of that blueprint and that building would be a protein. So it's a basic unit of information. Specifically, we imagine that um, in a chromosome, we have about um, hundreds to maybe even thousands of genes um, in chromosome. So I'll just write C-R-O-M-O -O for chromosome. So many, many genes um, consist of uh, consist and make up one single chromosome. A term you should definitely know is locus. Locus is the specific part of the chromosome at which a gene is found. So we'll write specific part of chromo where gene is located. 
So that's an important part of the chromosome. It's called the locus because that's uh, sort of a way to say location. The location of a gene is the locus. So if you have a chromosome, if we imagine this being a chromosome, and I have this area right here where the arrow is specifically pointing to, that's a locus. Let's imagine this gene codes for eye color, let's say. And that's the locus of the eye color gene, the specific location on the chromosome at which we would find the specific gene in question. In addition, genes are usually in a linear sequence. What we mean by this is that they are found in a DNA double helix that's easily accessible. And in addition, the human uh, body, the human cell, let's say, has about 20,000 genes in it. Just something to know. 20,000 genes make up everything that we do and are. So it's a very sort of amazing sort of number to think that that's everything that we are. 20,000 genes encompasses all of us, everything that makes us human. So in addition, we want to look at different forms of genetic material, let's say. We mentioned that chromosomes are a form of genetic material, but more specifically, I think it's important to mention the idea of chromatin also. This is where students often get confused. They say, oh, well, aren't they the same thing? They're definitely not. Chromatin is defined as DNA and the associated proteins, like histones, um, in a dispersed state. This is very important because this is actually the state, um, when we say dispersed state, we basically mean that if you look at chromatin under a microscope, let's say, like a light microscope, we actually see thread-like fibers. They look like thread-like fibers. They literally look like this. Imagine a cell. Imagine the nucleus like this. It's just a bunch of lines, thread-like fibers. No sort of structure whatsoever. It's very dispersed, the overall DNA structure. It's important to mention chromatin because this is actually um, the majority of the time how DNA and genetic material is in its structure. That's the structure of DNA most of the time. So we can put that into words by saying during CC, which means cell cycle, it's mostly in this state mostly in this state. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the cell cycle. So it's important to understand that during the majority of the time, chromosomes or genetic material will be found in what state? Chromatin. Make sure you remember that. And then where do we get chromosomes from? Well, chromosomes form when these dispersed, wild sort of genetic material, thread-like fibers, that when that condenses and coils, once we condense those and coil um, during cell division specifically, so during CD, cell division, that actually is going to form what we commonly refer to as a chromosome, a much more organized structure, a much more easily visible structure. So we go from this wild sort of dispersed like thread-like structure to that classic X structure that we see like this. We usually would start off at something like this, very wild chromatin thread-like structure, but it's important to note that this structure right here is what it's mostly found in during the cell cycle. In addition, we have to also mention that each chromosome, once it's turned into a chromosome, has a couple of unique defining characteristics. Each chromosome has a unique size and also shape. Every chromosome has a unique size and shape. Uh, every chromosome has a centromere. A centromere is a specific region of the chromosome that's a constricted area. It's a constricted area of the chromosome. And this is where the spindle attaches. This is where the spindle that's going to be involved in moving the chromosomes during um, cell division, during uh, mitosis specifically, um, attaches here. The spindle attaches here. Um, and also, Every chromosome has two regions called telomeres. Two telomeres, these are just the tips. So two tips. We can just put that in quotes. So what we can imagine is if we go back to our chromosome down over here, this central region right here is considered the centromere. It's a constricted area. It will often be represented by a circle, uh, sort of a uh, heavily bolded dot. And then the two tips are right here. We have a telomere over here and over here. And these are the two tips of the chromosome. So that's what every single chromosome has once it's in this condensed and coiled state, once it condenses and coils and turns into a chromosome. That's what we see. And then finally we're going to end this video by looking at the number of chromosomes. That's a very important topic. 
because this is where also students get confused because now we have to look at haploid and diploid. When we mention haploid or the haploid number, we're simply referring to n, lowercase n, and then when we mention diploid, we are referring to the diploid number of 2n. Okay, We're going to see why it's called n and 2n in right now. So a haploid number refers to the number of distinct chromosomes. Independent distinct chromosomes in a cell. So we'll say in cell. The number of distinct chromosomes. What I mean by this is that these are specifically, this is the, hap the haploid number is only found in gametes for that reason. Gametes are just sex cells like sperm and egg. Gametes only have one copy. What I mean by this is they have one copy of each chromosome. And so contrastingly, if we look at the number of chromosomes in a diploid cell, in a diploid cell, a diploid cell is usually going to be the somatic cells. Somatic cells just refer to body cells, regular old cells that are not sex cells, anything that is not a sex cell. Somatic cells actually have two copies. What do we mention about haploid? Haploid number, or the N number, is found in gametes and only has one copy of each chromosome. Somatic cells actually have two copies. Why do they have two copies? Because it actually has representation from mom and dad, from the father and the mother, that combined to create the offspring. When we have two copies of somatic cell chromosomes, these chromosomes are going to form a pair, and that pair is going to be considered homologous. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-O-U-S, just in case you can't see that. A homologous pair of chromosomes are two somatic chromosomes that are exactly the same because they are one copy from mom and one copy from dad. Um, they're, oh, excuse me, they're not exactly the same, but they're very similar, okay? They have the genes from mom and the genes from dad, and those two copies will form a homologous pair. Whereas in gametes, you only have one copy of each chromosome, and that's going to be sort of your input into the offspring. The other haploid is going to come from the other side of the offspring situation. So, and finally, we're going to conclude by just looking at a um, very quick example. Um, humans themselves, we are humans, of course. We have 46 chromosomes, and those 46 chromosomes are found in 23 homologous pairs. So overall, we've established the idea of chromosomes, haploid number, diploid number, um, and uh, we understand that they're in a very highly organized structure that eventually results in the idea of genes. Genes are found at a specific locus. Chromatin, most of the time chromosomes or DNA, genetic materials found in this state. Each chromosome has the following characteristics, and it's important to differentiate that haploid number is always found in gametes. Diploid number 2N is found in somatic cells because there are two copies, one from mom, one from dad, that each represent their own genetic material, and that copy is going to be considered a homologous pair of chromosomes.